Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Anib Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the top stories first. The Taliban claim to have captured two more districts in Afghanistan. In a tweet, spokesperson Zabiullah Mujahid said they seized Khoshamand in Paktika province and Khwaja Omari in Ghazni. The group said the fighters killed many government troops during clashes in Khoshamand, whereas Kabul says it has killed over 100 fighters during operations in eight provinces in the past 24 hours. Iran says it has yet to decide whether to extend a monitoring deal with the UN nuclear watchdog which lapsed last week. Talking to the media, a foreign ministry spokesperson, Saeed Khatib Zadeh, said there has also been no decision about deleting the data and footage from the agency's cameras. This follows a warning by Washington that Iran's failure to renew the deal would complicate talks to revive the 2015 nuclear accord. Sweden's Prime Minister Stefan Löfven has resigned, giving the Parliament Speaker the job of finding a new Premier. Löfven was given the option to either call a snap election or step down. The Prime Minister said a snap election was not the best way forward for the politics of Sweden. The Social Democrat leader lost a vote of confidence last week. Brazil has reported more than 700 daily deaths from COVID-19 and over 33,000 infections. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported 20 more fatalities and little over 900 cases in the past 24 hours. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.9 million lives and has infected over 181 million people. And in football, Ecuador and Peru have advanced into the quarterfinals of the Copa America. Ecuador held Brazil to a one-all draw in Guayania, while Peru beat Venezuela 1-0 to seal their place in the last eight. The quarterfinal matchups will be decided today after the last round of Group A fixtures. Well, these were the top stories news in detail after a short break. Welcome back now. Let's have the news in detail. Start from Afghanistan, where the Taliban claim to have captured two more districts. In a tweet, spokesperson Zabiullah Mujahid said they seized Khoshamand in Baktika province and Khwaja Omari in Ghazni. The group said the fighters killed many government troops during clashes in Khoshamand. Whereas Kabul says it has killed over 100 fighters during operations in eight provinces in the past 24 hours. Meanwhile, a civilian has been killed and four others injured after a blast targeted a vehicle in Nangarhar province. The governor's spokesperson says the wounded in Jalalabad have been shifted to hospital. However, no group has claimed responsibility for the blast so far. Now, Iran says it has yet to decide whether to extend a monitoring deal with the UN nuclear watchdog, which lapsed last week. This follows a warning by Washington that Iran's failure to renew the deal would complicate talks to revive the 2015 nuclear accord. Talking to the media, a foreign ministry spokesperson, Saeed Khatib Zadeh, said there has also been no decision about deleting the data and footage from the agency's cameras. Earlier, the Speaker of Iran's parliament said Iran will never hand over images from some nuclear sites to the UN. Mohammed Bakir Kalibav said a monitoring agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency has expired. Both sides struck the three-month pact in February after Tehran decided to reduce cooperation with the agency. Now, the Arab collision fighting in Yemen says it has shot down six armed Houthi drones and four ballistic missiles within the past 48 hours. Saudi state media quoted the coalition as saying it shot down the projectiles on Hamis Mushad city. However, Houthi spokesperson Yahya Sari claims the group targeted sensitive military sites in Najran, Abha and Hamis Mushad. 
Meanwhile, fighting between Yemen's warring parties in the gas-rich Marib region has intensified in recent days. Saudi media quoted Yemeni army officials as saying that dozens of Houthi fighters have been killed overnight in air raids. They also claim to capture several areas west of Al-Khanjar military base. This comes as Yemen's president, Abid Rabu Mansur Hadi, traveled to the U.S. shortly after a meeting with senior government officials in Riyadh. Now the U.S. military has carried out airstrikes against Iran-backed militia in Iraq and Syria. In a statement, a Pentagon spokesperson said it targeted operational and weapons storage facilities. John Kirby said President Joe Biden authorized the strikes in response to drone attacks on U.S. personnel and facilities in Iraq. He did not say whether anyone was killed or injured. But the Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said at least five fighters were killed and several others wounded. Meanwhile, Syrian state media says a child was killed and three civilians injured in the air raid. This is the second time Biden has ordered retaliatory attacks against armed groups since taking office. Now, Sweden's Prime Minister Stefan Löfven has resigned, giving the Parliament Speaker the job of finding a new Premier. Löfven was given the option to either call a snap election or step down. The Prime Minister said a snap election was not the best way forward for the politics of Sweden. The Social Democrat leader lost a vote of confidence last week. Löfven failed to find a fresh backing in Parliament, which might have resulted in his re-election. His resignation was triggered after the left party withdrew its support over the softening of immigration laws. Ukraine and the U.S. will start a military exercise involving more than 30 countries in the Black Sea on Monday. They follow heightened tensions between Moscow and NATO and Moscow and Kyiv. In a statement, the U.S.'s Navy 6th Fleet said Washington is committed to maintaining security in the Black Sea. It said the sea breeze drills will focus on amphibious warfare, land maneuvers and anti-submarine warfare. NATO, Israel, Canada, Australia, Germany, France, United Kingdom, Pakistan, Japan, South Korea, UAE are among the participating nations. They will provide 5,000 troops, 32 ships and 40 aircraft to the two-week long drills. Russia has termed the exercises a provocation alleging them to be a garb to transport military equipment into Ukraine. Also, Moscow has accused the European Union of mimicking U.S. policy towards Russia. In an article, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said, the bloc wishes to normalize ties right after the U.S.-Russia summit. He said Brussels is following in the footsteps of Big Brother Washington. But Lavrov said it is yet to be determined if the fruits of the Geneva summit materialize. He added, the West does not like Russia standing up for states that have become victims of its adventures. Lavrov said Moscow is accused of aggressive policies when it counters ultra-radical and neo-Nazi tendencies of the West. Moving on, Myanmar's military says the country intends to expand its cooperation with Russia. In an interview, the coup leader said, Naypyidaw needs to enhance its defense capabilities due to the interest of major powers. Min Aung Hlaing said he discussed air defense with Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu in Moscow last week. Hlaing said Myanmar's military has become one of the strongest in the region thanks to Russia. Various lawyers in Myanmar say the situation is becoming worse amid mounting harassment and arrests. The military has detained at least five lawyers for defending politicians and activists in the past month. Meanwhile, the nationwide anti-coup protests continue despite the killing of over 880 civilians. Now, South Korea says it plans to take part in a large-scale naval exercise by the U.S. and Australia next month. The Talisman Sabre exercise is the largest bilateral training activity between Washington and Canberra. The Korean Defense Ministry said it will send a 4,400-ton class destroyer through a drill in Australian waters. Britain, Canada, New Zealand and Japan will also join this year's exercise. Meanwhile, Australia's Defense Ministry says the drills will be scaled back due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Around 17,000 personnel are set to take part in the exercise, about half the number in 2019. Now, Brazil has reported more than 700 daily deaths from COVID-19 and over 33,000 infections. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.9 million lives and has infected over 181 million people so far. More details about the pandemic in this report. Despite vaccination campaigns, the COVID-19 pandemic is raging in countries that have detected the highly infectious Delta variant. India has recorded more than 396,000 deaths, but health experts and statisticians say this vastly undercounts the actual toll. Thousands of migrant workers are fleeing Bangladesh capital, Dhaka, ahead of a new tough coronavirus lockdown. In Oceania, the Delta outbreak is proving to be the Achilles heels for New Zealand and Australia. Wellington is expected to exclude Australia's New South Wales from its quarantine free travel bubble as cases mount. Outbreaks are emerging across Australia in a new phase of the pandemic due to the Indian strain. Now, whilst uh, the numbers today are less than the numbers yesterday, we have to be prepared for the numbers to bounce around and we also have to be prepared for the numbers to go up considerably because as experience shows with this strain, we are seeing uh, almost 100% of transmission within households and we're seeing a very high rate of transmissibility. In Europe, Germany is likely to ban British travellers from the European Union regardless of their vaccination status. Meanwhile, Luxembourg Prime Minister Xavier Battel has tested positive for coronavirus and will spend 10 days in isolation. Over in South Africa, the government has reimposed restrictions for two weeks to combat a surge in the Delta variant. As I address you this evening, the situation has gotten worse. Along with many other countries on our continent, Africa, South Africa is seeing a massive resurgence of infections. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia has authorized the Pfizer vaccine for children aged 12 to 18. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported another 20 coronavirus deaths, the lowest tally in a single day since the third wave began. The health ministry says the virus infected 914 people in the past 24 hours. Officials say the tally of fatalities has surged to 22,231. There are over 32,000 active cases in Pakistan and nearly 2,000 are critical. The virus has infected over 955,000 people since the pandemic began. More than 901,000 have recovered. Moving on now, Turkey and Azerbaijan have started joint military drills in Baku. The Defense Ministry of Azerbaijan says the exercises are in line with a bilateral agreement on military cooperation. They said the main objective is to improve cooperation between armies of the two countries during combat operations. The exercises will last until June 30th and involve up to 600 military personnel, 40 tanks and other armored vehicles. Moreover, artillery, combat and transport helicopters, unmanned aerial vehicles and auto vehicles will also participate. Hamas political chief Ismail Haniye arrived in Lebanon as part of an Arab tour to rally support for the Palestinian cause. In a press briefing in Beirut, Haniye said the visit aims to advocate for the rights of Palestinians. He said Palestinians have a right to return and rejected any notion of another homeland. The Hamas leader said his meetings will focus on political developments after the Gaza ceasefire last month. Hamas seeks to revive support against the Israeli occupation during the tour that included Egypt, Morocco and Mauritania. More news coming up after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back now in Somalia. At least 30 people have been killed in an Al-Shabaab attack in the semi-autonomous state of Galmudug. A military official says the Al-Qaeda-linked insurgents used car bombs to target the military base in Wissil town. He said the attack triggered a fight between the militants and government troops along with armed locals. 
It said 17 soldiers and 13 civilians died in the ensuing fighting. Meanwhile, witnesses say as many people have also been injured in the attack. This comes just a day after Somali authorities executed 21 Al-Shabaab fighters in Puntland state. Now, the Democratic Republic of Congo has put the city of Benai under curfew after three bombs rocked the east of the country. Authorities have warned that there are reports of more attacks being planned in the city. Authorities warned they have reports more attacks are being planned. This comes after a makeshift bomb went off in a church in Ring to Women, followed by a suicide bombing outside a bar. A day earlier, a bomb exploded near a patrol station on the outskirts of Benai, but did not cause any damage. Benai is one of the two regions placed under a state of siege since May 6th to clamp down on rebel violence. Now, a group of fighters from Nigeria's Boko Haram has promised allegiance to ISIS in western Nigeria. This fuels fears that ISWEP is making gains in the region after the death of Boko Haram leader Abu Bakr Shekau. A video released by the ISIS media wing showed several hundred armed men gathering in the bush. A Boko Haram fighter in Hausa said the groups will unite to fight and threatened unprecedented outcomes. The groups have engaged in a violent rivalry for years. If ISWAP absorbs Boko Haram fighters, it could focus attention on attacking the Nigerian military. Now moving to the U.S. state of Florida, where hope is fading for the 152 still missing in the building collapse that has so far claimed nine lives. No one has been pulled alive from the debris since Thursday. Miami-Dade County Mayor Daniela Levine Cavas said one person died in the hospital while eight bodies were recovered from the rubble. At a press conference, Levine Cavas said six to eight squads of rescuers backed by two huge cranes are continuing the search tirelessly. Officials say 130 people have been accounted for so far. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says debris with forensic value will be inspected to help determine the cause of the collapse. Torrential rains have prompted Hong Kong authorities to issue a black rainstorm warning. Officials had to temporarily suspend the stock trading session as floodwaters gushed over roads in Lantau. The Hong Kong Observatory recorded more than 70 millimeters of rainfall in several districts. While in Hong Kong, Island West, Lantau and Lama rainfall exceeded 150 millimeters. Water triggered by the storm gushed over railings, flooding an office building at Upper Cheung Cha Beach. The storm also prompted authorities to close schools, suspend coronavirus vaccinations and postpone court hearings. Now, a historic heat wave has blistered the northwest U.S. and Canada with record temperatures. Temperatures soared to an all-time high of nearly 44.5 degrees Celsius in Oregon's large city, Portland. The National Weather Service says the heat wave is likely to be one of the most extreme and prolonged in the region's history. It has already placed all of Washington and Oregon under an excessive heat warning. Meanwhile, in western Canada, temperatures soaring to new highs have triggered heat warnings in Arctic territories. Environment Canada has issued alerts for British Columbia, Alberta, Yukon and the Northwest Territories. Now, a hotel for pets, the first of its kind, has opened in the West Bank. Located in the town of Bir Zayt, the Pet Palace offers accommodation, grooming and pet supplies. George Gaddis has fulfilled his dream by opening a hotel for pets in the West Bank. He says there is a need for such a service as it offers pet owners a solution when they travel. I've raised dogs and pets throughout all of my life. I've had most types of pets and I always had trouble finding a place to keep my dogs when I travel. Or if I want to bathe them, take them to play, groom them or take them anywhere. There is no place in this country that provides these services. I've traveled a lot and saw many similar places abroad and that is how I got the idea. Although the project was seen as silly by Gattis' family and friends, but he was not dissuaded and was convinced that the hotel will fill in a much-needed service gap. 
It is a great adventure. When I first informed my family and friends that I intend to open a hotel for dogs, they made fun of me and would tell me that this is silly. But honestly, I was surprised. Well, not very surprised, since I expected it. But those around me were surprised by the excellent turnout to the hotel since it was established. The Pet Palace only serves a limited portion of the Palestinian pet owners as its services are seen as instrumental. This is a very important, convenient and nice project that provides a safe place for pets, especially that a lot of people have to run errands and need a place to put the dog or want to travel. Gattis says he is satisfied with the turnout of the hotel and aspires to extend the project to care for stray dogs. Now, Britain and Singapore will start talks on a digital trade agreement on Monday. It could remove trade barriers to digital technology. British Trade Minister Liz Truss says a deal with Singapore will keep London at the forefront of the technological revolution. In a statement, she said the agreement will ensure Britain leads the way in fine tech and cyber security. Truss added the UK will be the first European state to negotiate a digital economy agreement. The talks are a part of London's post-Brexit attempts to become a global tech powerhouse. Well, European stocks have slipped as investors monitor rising COVID-19 around the globe, aggravated by the Indian Delta variant. London's FTSE is leading the losses, sliding almost half a percent. The CAC 40 in Paris, Italy's FTSE MIB and the pan-European stock 600 have also shed marginally. Frankfurt's DAX has too edged lower fractionally. Earlier Asian stocks also lost over concerns regarding the Indian strain. And with that, we come to the end of this news bulletin. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.